All right. Well, we're going to get started with our event. Um, welcome everybody um, to What's the Point 2021. Um, just to get started, um, I want to make a note that we will be this session and um, posting it to our website. Um, Erica, who is from DNR, she will be running some behind the scenes for me. Um, and uh, she can put the link into our website in the chat. And um, if you also have any further questions, and we'll elaborate more um, as the event goes on, you can send an email to me directly. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming. We appreciate your interest. Um, and we'll get started pretty quick because we have a pretty tight schedule. Um, yeah, so we're just going to get started. My name is Rondi, and I'm the Aquatic Reserves monitoring and stewardship coordinator at resources and i'll be your host for the event today um i'm just going to get started with a brief introduction about the event um and a quick summary of the locations and speakers here today um and then i'll pass it off to erica who will talk a little bit about aquatic reserves and then we'll get to our speakers at the beaches um and i do want to note too we won't have much time for answering questions in the q a feature um, but we will be able to answer questions at our Q&A panel next week, which we'll provide more information for later. Um, so what's the point is a low tide event that we hold every year um, where naturalists invite people to explore the beach at Point Whitehorn Marine Reserve usually, which is a Whatcom County Park that's located within, within the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve. Um, it's a really great opportunity to learn about all kinds of beach critters, algae, and the habitats that are found between the high and low tide zones um, that are visible when the water recedes. This year, of course, we can't really encourage a lot of people to get out on the beach all at the same time, um, and so we decided to host it virtually. There have been a lot of really great virtual events um, in the last year or so, and we were really inspired to do something cool. Um, so we're going to be hosting our event here on Zoom, or you're here, um, with speakers tuning in from different beaches across Whatcom County. And I'll be pulling up a map to show where some of the locations are later. Um, and yeah, we also recommend checking out our website for more resources, including the recording for today's event. And we'll have, um, as I mentioned before, links to all of that in the chat. So I will do a quick screen share to show um, some of the locations that we're visiting today. Um, just give me a second. And so this is a map available on the website. Um, so we'll be starting out today at Point Whitehorn. Let's go. Point Whitehorn Marine Reserve um, at Neptune Beach at Marine Park in Fairhaven. And we'll also be tuning in from Mud Bay. Um, I highly recommend checking out other beaches that are listed here on the map. Um, but these are the ones that we have people at today, um, either for surveys, um, such as Sea Star Surveys and Olympia Oysters, or just because they're really cool beaches that our naturalists knew a lot about. Um, and so we'll have um, lots of variety today. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. Um, but yeah, so I will pass it over to Erica, who will talk a little bit about aquatic reserves. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? I think we can hear you, Erica. Okay, perfect. Can you see my screen? Yep, you're all good. Great. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for coming to What's the Point. It looks a little bit different this year, and I just wanted to kind of welcome you to our event and get you situated in what's happening and, and where folks are. I work for the Department of Natural Resources and the DNR manages millions of acres of lakes and streams and marine waters. And of those millions of acres, aquatic reserves make up a really small portion and have been chosen for more protection because the 
the reserves protect underwater habitats that are really pretty special. You can kind of think of these areas as a state park, but instead of being on land, they're all underwater. Um, we really like to focus scientific research and encourage people like you to get out and play on the beaches and explore and, and see what you can find. Cherry Point is only one of eight reserves in Washington and is highlighted on this map here with a big red arrow. It's the northernmost reserve and it is nestled right at the bottom of a huge body of water called the Strait of Georgia which is a really windy and rowdy place sometimes, especially on days like today. Um, so hopefully you're able to hear our folks that are out there on the beach. But today you kind of get to enjoy being inside and enjoying these beaches from your couch. But we have some amazing low tides coming up and I'm hopeful that you can get out this weekend and explore the area yourself and get to run around and enjoy the amazing place that we all live. So thanks for coming. I'm gonna pass it back to Rondi, who's gonna be guiding you through beach to beach and kind of your tour guide for today. Awesome, thank you so much, Erica. I'm really glad to have you here. Um, so we're gonna switch gears and start with our first speaker of the day. Um, first up is Eleanor Hines, Bob Lemon, and Michael Kite tuning in from Neptune Beach. Um, they just finished up a sea star survey. So let's see what Okay, I we're tuning in here from Neptune Beach. I'm Eleanor Hines, lead scientist, Marcel and Baykeeper at Resources, and um, we do a lot of work with the aquatic reserve. So thanks everyone for tuning in. And um, we can't control the weather, so we're gonna do the best we can. And um, with that, I am going to turn it over to if I can get the screen to turn around. My hands are too cold to pick up the <laughs> touch screen. Um, um, without further ado, here is Michael Kite, one of our lead naturalists who um, has been out here today helping to lead a sea star survey. Michael, you're up. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Kite. I am a, a semi-retired marine biologist, uh, retired 2012, and I started uh, sea star surveys under uh, the sea star wasting disease program uh, for the University of California, uh, led by Melissa Miner out of uh, Bellingham. And today we tried to do a quantitative survey uh, out here, but the tide didn't go out far enough, fast enough. Uh, but this is Jerry Point, and it has quite a bit. Um, uh, behind me and off to my, my left, your right, and, in, and, and by Bob here, we have a typical sea star, Pisaster or Crasis, or the ochre sea star. This was a healthy one. But if it was sick, it would have white lesions on it and maybe even have the arms falling off. Very nasty sometimes. We saw one yesterday with the arms were completely falling off and it's very nasty. Uh, so instead of a quantitative survey today, we did what was called anecdotal observations where I had two teams searching over about 100 meters of beach and recording their numbers. Um, the other thing of note out here, uh, which I've been noting for many years now, is the invasive species. Sargassum uticum or the Japanese wireweed. Uh, this was brought in many years ago, uh, probably in conjunction with the oyster industry back in the 1950s or so. It's an invasive weed. It uh, reduces the diversity of the uh, reds and browns native algae. And we have uh, Bob Lemon here to talk about those. With that, Bob. That's clear. I have uh, I'm holding up a piece of sargassum. Uh, no shortage of it. Uh, I don't mind uh, tearing it off the uh, attachment uh, because uh, it's invasive. So if that name sounds a little familiar to you, sargassum, yes, it's the same genus that makes up the sargassum tree, but uh, in the Atlantic, uh, but um, the uh, progressive sea is made up of, of a genus that doesn't attach to anything. And what we have here, what we have on the other side of the Pacific, is uh, a kind of sargassum that attaches to 
in the inner title, it has a hold fast. That's not a root system. It has a law of stipe and a float, oddly enough, filled with, uh, with the carbon monoxide. And fronds that lay out on the surface of the water and gather sunlight photosynthesis. Uh, this is just a few inches long, but these are primarily subtitle. And uh, to uh, survive, to get that float up to the surface, the stipe needs to be 30 or more feet long. And there's a seamount in the uh, uh, quite a few miles off the Washington coast, a couple of them. The seamounts are up to, uh, they, they rise up to nearly 100 feet to the surface and they're covered with this uh, bull kelp, in which case the stipe needs to grow 100 feet instead of the typical 30 feet like we have here. So I promised reproduction. Uh, this is far too young and will probably never reach, uh, never reach maturity because I picked it up right here in the intertidal. Too stressful for this subtitle material. But the squares about palm size develop on these leafy like. Uh, pieces and they're darker and they convert or they change themselves from being photosynthetic to um, to spore producing and the little patch think of it as a uh, patch like a quilting patch will fall out of the ground and fall down to the bottom. And that's when it releases its spores, right where the parent plant was successful. That'd be a good place to put the spores. Um, and that begins a new generation. Little tiny microscopic things. I can't show you any. Even if you were diving, you couldn't be able to find them. They are literally microscopic. And um, 
that's the overwintering generation. And they, uh, there's a male and female little microscopic thing. And they, uh, put all of their energy into reproduction. Uh, since they're nearby each other, uh, the male sperm find a little female plant fertilize it and and right at that spot this new uh spore producing half of the generation begins to grow around midwinter and it uh needs to reach the surface of the water so that um it can get all the sunlight of summer and the, uh, the cycle repeats itself. So 30 feet of stripe growth, typically, all occurs in one growing season. And all of these uh, fronds occur in one growing season. So that's it pretty impressive. I, I hadn't seen any trees yet that grow 30 to 40 feet in one season or <laughs> anything. The corn grows pretty fast, but not, not like this. So that might be enough of, uh, enough of marriage. Just how, how much time does it drive? Um, a little over five minutes. Five minutes. Well, uh, speaking of growth, uh, no, we'll use this as the as the prop. So where maybe the question worth asking? Oh, this is a good prop right here. Nope, that's the rock it came off of. So. Here's another little brown algae. Um, it's going to be a big shelf, but I can't tell that for sure yet. So, the tree, I, I got this in the, just as we were <laughs> uh, gathering today to uh, do the sea star survey. So, we expect a tree or a land plant of just about any kind to grow from a growing tip. Here's last year's needles, and there, then this year's needles just burst out. So the tree grows from the very, each branch and the fire grows from the very tips of the branches. I don't think that's going to work very well with algae. So what it does, oh, in this case, some little hold fast gets started here and the uh, uh, growth comes just, just at the base of the blade and it keeps pushing out and out and out and out and out. And this is a good example of why that works. The distal end gets frayed. It thrashes around with waves and so forth, and it wears away, but it's constantly getting replaced from a growth meristem down near the base of the blade. That's pretty typical of many kinds of algae. So the blade in, a, in, in one season's growth, the blade can be replaced as much as six times. Um, <laughs> you see one blade, that's just a certain size, but throughout the season, there has been replacement and more replacement uh, as much as six or so times. 
So the left one algae grows. Um, let's see. How much time now? Four minutes. Four minutes. Three, four. Three minutes. Okay, just <laughs> may, maybe just <laughs> barely enough time to talk about porphyra. Um, porphyra can be found. We don't. Uh, uh, it's not spreading out very well. It can be found on the tops of, oh, well, that's the one I brought in. That didn't grow there. That's cheating. But it can be found, strangely enough, on the tops of big boulders high in the intertidal. Am I still being heard? Okay. High in the intertidal. Now, that, that seems strange. Um, why would a delicate thing like this, that's only one cell or two cells thick, um, the stuff that nori's made of, why would it grow in such a hostile place as the top of a boulder? Well, it has a secret. Um, the secret is it does most of this big vegetative growth in the winter. In the winter, it's not troubled by graziers. It's not sunburned by excessively sunny days or just too hot, nice and foggy and rainy, keeps it wet at low tide. Um, many of the hazards of what was expected to be seasonal growth are uh, dodged by growing in the winter. Uh, just one more hazard is, well, not a hazard, but I, uh, a challenge is competition for space with other species. Not much competing with it in the middle of the winter. So it goes through a reproductive cycle that's seasonally the opposite of what one might expect. Winter is over. This begins to deteriorate. It sheds it sheds spores, um, which are carried um, on a good high tide out to the um, subtitle, and they settle. I'm going to get the prop. They're, they settle. They they somehow know that they need to settle on. You know, discarded lamb or oyster shell or some kind of mollusk shell. And they set they, they burrow into the shell. So the appearance is that um, that there's little filamentous and it's the same species as this material here. It's just the overwinter, pardon me, not overwintering. We already talked about that. So it's the oversummering uh, phase uh, half of the life cycle. Um, so that's the strategy, the survival strategy for the fire to stop And it's quite the opposite of the bull uh, kelp strategy. You remember bull kelp, bull kelp strategy, which is summer season. The big, big bodied material. Um, winter, the overwinters sheltered from uh, waves that could jerk this float 
and throw it up on the beach, which is what happened. Um, and mm -hmm. other things like low light conditions in the uh, in the winter. So I think my time may be up. Yes, I'm getting nod. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Bob. Okay. Uh, that was super informative. So back to you, Randy. Awesome. Thank you, Michael, Bob, the sea stars, and the talk about the algae. Super interesting and really lovely. I um, really appreciate you being able to tune in today. Um, so next up, we'll have Casey Cook from the Marine Life Center and Catherine Sell from the Garden of the Salish Sea zooming in from Marine Park in Fairhaven. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Sell from Garden of the Salish Sea Curriculum. And today I am with Casey Cook from the Bellingham Marine Life Science Center. And Casey's going to walk us through our discoveries today. Hi, Mermaid Casey. You might know me from Port of Bellingham's Marine Life Center. And we're at a Port of Bellingham Beach uh, down here in Fairhaven Marine Park is one of my most favorite beaches. And I wanna say one of my most favorites because I love Point Whitehorn. And when I think of Point Whitehorn and I'm down on the beach and I'm thinking about what makes Point Whitehorn special, I think of a couple different things. And I think everybody has a take home uh, once they've enjoyed that beach. And I feel like Marine Park is my second, uh, or like what's the point place because it, it parallels in biodiversity. It parallels in what you can take home and how many different uh, outcomes you can have every time you visit, whether you visit, everybody visits in the spring, whether you have people visiting winter, summer, fall, uh, this beach changes, it adapts with uh, the tides, it adapts with the seasons. So we did a FAPS mask, it evolves. Uh, evolves. Um, in 2004, the Port of Bellingham removes some large piers uh, right over by where most people park and come down the entrance. And so this is what it looked like before. And when they removed that, uh, what it did is it provided um, access to the public and it really changed, I think for the better, uh, the biodiversity here that allowed these intertidal organisms to spread and have more surface area uh, for the life uh, and all the changes that happen in the intertidal ecosystem. Um, this is a really crucial point uh, for Bellingham Bay. This is a very large estuary, an eelgrass bed, and an eelgrass bed is, is so important for some of our keystone species here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, salmon, herring, dungeness crabs, flatfish, like flounder, sole. A lot of these animals, like shrimp, start their lives in eelgrass beds right at the top of the intertidal earth, uh, space, and they're here for the plankton. They're here for uh, that rich upwelling that we get from Alaska that brings that mineral rich water uh, up through the islands and brings it right here with us. These minerals uh, feed the plankton and uh, the cytoplagellates uh, that feed the salt plankton that feed the tiny organisms that may one day uh, end up on our dinner plate or the animals plates. Um, we were just watching Catherine and I two bald eagles uh, flying overhead and discussing a meal with the crows and the seagulls here on the beach. We're watching uh, great blue herons out here hunting. They're eating things like gunnels and midshipmen. And the midshipmen are breeding here right now. And midshipmen, if you've never heard of a midshipman, uh, create a really fancy hump uh, snap in there in their breeding phase right now. And you find them under large rocks and their eggs look like salmon eggs and they cover the underside of the boulders. The males guard the nest, and if you pick them up, they pull very loud uh, to let you know, hey, I am doing a job here. And it's one of the funnest things that we see people down here exploring this time of year. But again, it depends on when you come to kind of what the takeaway message might be uh, for those visiting that day. Um, right now, we're looking at a pretty long time. That's the most incredible. So imagine at a new moon, it would be even further out and past this field grass bed here. Uh, this is our native, mostly native Zotra marina. Uh, we do have Japonica as well uh, mixed throughout, which is a smaller, uh, not native species of eelgrass. There is a like an uh, algae bed of kelps. We see uh, sugar rat, we see bull kelps, we see lots of reds and browns and other greens, ova. And uh, with that, you get a lot of extra uh, sea life that you don't get in just your traditional um, eelgrass bed. So you've got river otters hunting here. You have urchins. Um, by the hundreds on a good low tide. Um, but this also, uh, this extra element of algae brings a lot of detritus to this beach. 
And so detritus is something that occurs when you have decaying matter, whether it be animal matter, whether it be animal waste products, whether it be uh, algae breaking down. And so uh, we have a lot of detrital feeders here, which is really cool to experience. One of those famous ones is your sand dollar. But one of those infamous ones that I particularly love is called a spaghetti worm. And we actually have a couple of creatures right here and a spaghetti worm to show you. Um, so this is your live sand dollar. This is what you might know. Um, if you come here often, you might see thousands of these uh, when they're black and they are moving and they're spiny like this. This is a this is a live sand dollar. Um, but what you see in the stores is the skeleton of the white bleach looking radial shape there on the top. This is the bottom. And this mimics uh, your sea urchin. It's got the same body structure because uh, sand dollars more or less very similar to a flattened urchin, um, which is their cousin here. Let's see what else we've got. We've got some small sand dollars, some large sand dollars. We've got their cousin, the mottled star here. Uh, Evisterius trichelli is a five-armed common star in the inner, inner tidal um, area. We've got one exhibiting wasting disease here. You can see the, the white deterioration there. Oh, here we go. Here's one. You can see those five arms. The tip of the arm has those eye spots. If you didn't know, sea stars have as many eye spots as they have arms. So you got a nice sunflower 27 arm star. You've got 27 eyes. And here's the bottom uh, where the two feet are located, where the mouth of the star is located. Um, so other animals in this in this phylum are going to be your so your urchin, your cucumber, uh, your sea star, and your sand dollar. We also have a cousin star, a brittle star somewhere in here, if we can find it, which is also a detritivore here in the inner tidal zone. And it looks like I can't find my little friend here. Here's a baby ochre star, also known as a purple star. And he's attached to a If you happen to see that fish there, that was a fluffy sculpin, which was as green as the baby that likes it. Very common fish in the intertidal uh, area here. Sculpins are a bottom fish. They don't have that air bladder, so they don't uh, float around like a salmon very easily in the upper uh, water column. So you're going to find them on the bottom, uh, most of the shorelines here in the rocky areas. Um, along with here, we've got some anemones. And this is a stubby rose anemone, very common here. Along with these moonglow anemones, Anthoplura is uh, a intertidal species of anemone. So most of them host a single cell algae uh, called a zooxanthellae or zooplorelli in their bodies. And that can make them um, either a green or a brown. Um, they, they can come in other colors here. Um, we've also got lots of barnacles in this area. This Um, along with uh, other species of barnacles. It looks like maybe a rostry barnacle um, and then common acorn barnacles. There's thatch barnacles on this beach as well. Um, and you've got like, no longer platonic barnacles that have just made their first home on this shell, along with mature barnacles and then hundreds of what used to be barnacles on this shell. So complete life cycle all on one shell. And shells are really common on this beach because of that plankton load that we get here. Um, we've got gaper clams, we've got um, these heart cockles, we've got soft shell mud clams and crabs are an evidence of predators on those as well. This small hole could have been from a dog whelk, a carnivorous snail, or it could have been from a moon snail as well. And this is one of animal that drills into mollusks to consume them. So it would sit on top of this shell and use its radula to drill right into the soft meat of this animal. So I could go on and on and on here. There's so much to talk about at this beach. Um, I encourage people to come down and explore at a low tide, a high tide, there's a little less to see. Um, but we're off and down here uh, from the Marine Life Center exploring with you during the summer at uh, Marine Park. But what's the point as it is an event for really all of Walker County to explore your local beaches and get out there and ask questions and enjoy the day. So I hope you get out there and 
you see some cool stuff and you ask some great questions. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. I never knew that there are so many really cool critters out there. I've never seen a brittle star before. So I'll definitely make sure to get out to Marine Park and look around. Um, next up, we have Chris Brown and Kim Clarkin, who will teach us about Olympia oyster restoration in Mud Bay. slowly put back in. Uh, off to the, the far right behind me here are just the natural uh, rock exposure. A lot of uh, exposed blocks of stone. shellfish, clams, mussels, four or five, six species of mussels out here. Um, and then we've got the birds uh, that come down and feed off of these, uh, these shellfish. They take them up a few inches under the surface and fly over some rocks or on the railroad tracks and drop them like bombs or bring them up. And they, they do quite well with this uh, source of food out here. Uh, lots of algae. And then we've got the oysters out here, uh, which currently we have a lot of Pacific oysters. There are two kinds of oysters, and Pacific oyster has been introduced. Uh, it's been farmed out here. The, uh, what we're dealing with, what, what we want to do, the uh, restoration project, pilot project out here for Olympia oysters is our native oyster, the little one, much smaller than the Pacific oyster. Uh, was the original oyster out here, and uh, it's uh, it got decimated uh, for numerous reasons, and, and the MRC has uh, decided instead of to restore this uh, native oyster to the uh, Mud Bay flats out here, and so uh, the project we came up with about three or four years ago, and uh, it uh, we got a number of bags of shells with spat, which are baby oysters, and uh, we put them out here over the sound, uh, I'm sorry, over the bay, the mud bay here, and we uh, have been coming out for the past three or four years to come out and study the environment. So I'm standing 
so native oyster alive, native oyster here, some more here, one here, three or four here, and then there's some dead ones. This is a dead one, a dead one, some muscle up here. So on these Pacific oyster shells, we've managed to, to grow some Penelope oysters right on the shells, and in these bags that we put out, Now this is a Pacific oyster to give you a size comparison. This is what uh, people go out and buy. This is a young one. Uh, we had a set, a natural set out here in the bay uh, four or five years ago. And repeating. Hopefully we'll see how everything works out with this. So every year annually we come out and monitor and this year How does all this relate to what's the point? Well, uh, Cherry Point and Point Whitehorn are, uh, have been selected for their environmental uh, health and viability. Uh, but this bay, comparatively, has had 150 years of human, human uh, encroachment. And uh, so it's been uh, you know, damaging the marine habitat. So by putting these, these oyster shells out, Back to you, Ronnie. All right. Well, thanks, Chris. I'm glad to learn a little bit more about some of the work going on down there. And it's really cool to actually see Olympia oysters. They're not very common. So thank you for showing those to us. Um, next up, and our last speaker for the event is Lynn Gibbler, who's being filmed by Diane Hollins. And they're zooming in from Point Whiteboard, which is where this event normally takes place. So you'll get to see What's the point, even though we're not doing it in person? Hello, everyone, and welcome to What's the Point? We actually are near the point where this event usually takes place. Point Whitehorn is that away. Diane's, Diane's scanning there. Birch Bay State Park is that way. We actually access where we are right now today from Birch Bay. We parked at the boat launch. And if you come here sometime in the next several days, don't forget your Discover Pass. Getting here from um, the park, uh, Point Whitehorn Marine Park is a little bit longer. But we decided to stop at this location because in front of me 
behind me is a glacial erratic. So this giant rock was carried by the glaciers, came from Canada, and fortunate for us, it landed here. And this is sort of the perfect place to talk about intertidal zonation. Where on a beach do certain things live depending on where they are located next to the water? So on this particular erratic, Diane, can you scan up here? You can see that at the very top, we have a lot of barnacles. Is that coming through okay? And you see in a crevice, you start to notice black, which is mussels. So they found, typically they might be a little bit lower than some of these barnacles, but they found an area where they get protection. We'll move on down here. Here we've got a mix of mussels and barnacles both critters that are gathering food from the water, when the tide comes in, they open up and they start to grab plankton, other things in the water for sustenance. As we work our way down, we start to run into more seaweed. So Bob talked a bit about nori uh, and also sea lettuce. You can see these right here. These particular seaweeds, algae, can stand drying out somewhat, but again, all of these critters and all of these plants will be completely submerged when the tide comes in again. So Diane, if we can go down a little lower here. So in the crack and crevice here, you see some of the sea stars. I think Casey pointed these out. Purple sea stars, ochre sea stars. And these are the ones, as you learned earlier, had the sea star wasting syndrome, but these are looking pretty darn healthy, which is, really encouraging. There's also, this is kind of hard to see, but there's some sponge that's encrusting in here. And if we go over here, there's a red rock crab. You may not be able to see that, but it's hiding under the sea star. So it's getting in an area where it won't dry out. So why don't we move around the rock here a little. Diana, you ready? <laughs> We're hoping there's not too much wind in the camera today. We had uh, quite a rainstorm here right before we came on, but I think we're doing okay now. So here again, now we're getting on the other side of this rock. Another thing you'll notice with these erratics um, or any boulder that's on the beach is there'll be a slightly different zonation on the side that faces south versus north. Um, if there's a lot of hot sun hitting a rock in the middle of summer, a lot of these critters won't make it. Some of them settle and they settle fine in the early spring, but then when they become subject to the warmer weather of summer, some of them could just die off. So we'll keep working around here. We've been having fun watching eagles here, kingfisher. We saw a couple seals out there. So Birch Bay is pretty nice today. So we'll work our way around here. Now, Bob might have already talked about this. It was a little hard sometimes for us to hear out here in that wind. Um, this is sugar kelp. You can see some of it already is kind of starting to fade. What you'll find, especially when the sun starts to hit the algae, they start to lose some of those pigments. Um, here we have another, I don't know if you can see this, purple sea star, a smaller one settled on here. A lot of things hiding under rocks, um, lots of clams at Birch Bay. And I think as Casey pointed out, every little surface ends up getting covered with things. Mostly what we're seeing here are young barnacles. And as they grow, they're gonna start crowding each other out. All of these aren't gonna survive. So let's work our way a little over here. There's some, is it? Not too windy? Okay. Here we have an assortment of sea anemones. Um, maybe start, can you see this one right here? You can see this burrowing anemone. It, the, the tentacles are out, so you can actually see what it looks like when the tide covers it. 
use those tentacles to sting prey and also to sting things that may bother it. Um, as you move over here, here's another anemone. This one closing up, you can see, and another purple sea star. And Diane, if you can, right here, you can actually see an ochre sea star. So these, the purple and the orange are both the same species, but they're just different color variations. And you tend to see the orange one more as you get into, into more coastal waters where it's a little rougher. Here's another anemone, but this one all closed up. They do have little stinging cells, which your fingers don't really feel, but if you put your tongue on them, you might regret it. <laughs> and then over here, this is the pink tipped or the aggregating anemone. These ones here are all by their lonesome now, but this particular species actually can clone. And you'll often find big aggregations, which is why they're called the aggregating sea anemone. And when you see those, they're all genetically the same. In fact, they do little experiments where they separate out different uh, individuals and clones, take a couple of these colonies, and eventually they migrate back together. You can see the pink tips on that one. Oh, and here's a beautiful, another one, burrowing one, closely related here. Oh, and I'm seeing it. Oh, look, 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 look. There's a fish. Oh my God. Okay, I wish I knew what kind it was, but where's our fish? Oh, that's a beauty. I don't know if you can see it hiding among. Maybe later someone will be able to tell us what kind of fish that is. So it's found a little pool of water underneath here. Plenty of water to cover it up and get the oxygen it needs over those gills. That's pretty cool. Actually, the color from here is kind of similar to the sea stars. It really sort of blended in. Ooh, that is, that is very cool. Okay, we're gonna work our way over to a pile and then we got a mystery for you. Where did all these clam shells come from? Actually, there's a fair number of people out here today digging clams. So these are clams left over. You can see there's quite a healthy population out here. So the one here is the Washington butter clam. Anyway, let's work our way over here a bit. Um, I wanted to show you Something we've been seeing out in the Birch Bay area over the last week or so is a lot of Dungeness crab that are copulating. So the male gets on top of the female and it happens after the female has what's called molted. So this is a molt. Um, these are arthropods. They have an external skeleton. So in order to grow, they need to shed their outer skeleton. They also leave behind their gills. Um, but with these crabs, this is, you know, time of year, we see quite a bit of this. The female molts, but before her shell hardens up, that is when the male and the female mate. So we've had to be a little bit careful walking around that we don't ac accidentally step on one, but that's the Dungeness crab. Oh, and here's a soda straw, seaweed, cytosiphon. Maybe Bob showed this to you already. Okay, let's move around here a little bit. I know Bob had talked already about sargassum. Um, and here it is again. And as you go closer to the water's edge, there's a lot of it. Actually, we're not at the lowest tide here right now. But this glacial erratic is just such a beautiful place to stop and look at intertidal zonation and lots, lots of critters. But as you get further out, you'll see more and more of this invasive um, algae. And it's interesting because when I first started going to the beach, we never saw this. Um, it has certainly spread, spread around a lot. And again, more kelp in here. Oh, here's a whole lot of that soda straw seaweed. All of this stuff, things 
providing food as they're alive, providing food as they break down, releasing organic matter into the water. So all these critters have something to eat. Um, again, we're in a little bit different part of the, the erratic, but there's another red rock crab in here. We look at the colors, purple sea star. And here's a small, a small purple sea star. <laughs> We're scanning up that erratic again. Diane, do you want to walk a little bit down here? How are we doing for time? I think we might need to start wrapping up. Okay, let's wrap up. <laughs> but thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you. And bye, everyone. Come down to Point Whitehorn. All right. So again, thank you, Lynn and Diane. Um, this rock was a really great talking point. Um, really appreciate it. Um, so for the last couple minutes of the webinar, I want to remind everyone that we'll be posting a recording of this on our website. And we'll have a Q&A panel discussion on Tuesday, June 1st, starting at 6.30. Um, there's a registration link for it on the website, on the events page. Um, and I highly encourage you to attend, especially if you had any questions from today. Um, are you curious about what that pile of clamshells is? We might get to talk about it. Um, you can also forward emails or forward questions to me um, via email. Um, my email is listed on the website, but Erica, if you maybe drop that in the chat too. Um, and for more, and we also have a wide variety of resources on the website, um, including educational videos, dates for the low tides coming up this summer, great beach locations, as you saw on the map, um, beach exploration tips, and so much more. Um, check out our partner websites as well. That'll be linked on the website um, in the partners tab. Their link, they have so many great resources in addition to what we have on the website, um, especially Garden of the Sailor Sea, where Catherine is from. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming. I hope you learned something and I hope you'll check out the website and maybe attend our upcoming event. Um, and I also wanna take a minute to thank everybody who's been involved with this from event partners, presenters, videographers, anyone that's helped get this off the ground. So thank you so much. Um, and with that, I'll conclude the webinar and thanks for coming and I hope you have a great rest of the day.